Good morning and welcome to the BMO UK High Income Trust PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Direct and Head of Investment Trust, Christine Cantrell, and Portfolio Manager, Philip Webster. Good morning to you both. Morning, morning. and thanks, Alessandro. Um, so just a couple of words for me, uh, in case you're not familiar with BMO Global Asset Management. Uh, we have been owned by Bank of Montreal, but were recently acquired by Columbia Threadneedle, um, which now makes us actually in the top 10 of UK asset managers. So um, I've been in the industry more than 12 years, um, but more importantly, we have Phil Webster here, the portfolio manager of BMO UK High Income, and he's going to talk about the portfolio today and you know what his outlook is for the markets which is very timely um but i'll just um in case you don't want to read through the whole biography it's important to know he's been in the markets and running european funds for 20 years or more uh, so with that i will hand over to phil thanks christine thanks for the introduction um good morning all and, and thanks very much for uh, joining us on the call today i think as the guys have said you can submit questions as we go along and I think Christine's going to um, going to try and do it in a sort of ordinary fashion if we can towards the end of this. Um, I think it is quite timely for you to be speaking with us at the moment. Um, as Christine said, I've been in the industry for sort of nearly two decades and I think with Brexit, COVID and the actions of Russia yesterday, we're certainly in some pretty unprecedented times and I think navigating this has been pretty difficult for investors given the volatility we've seen in markets so there are no bad questions I might not be able to answer them all but uh, we will do our best given the, the current environment and backdrop there's the usual investment disclaimer that we have to put up around risk so I will let you have a read at that at your leisure but it's there just as a reminder of the risk of investing in equities in general in terms of the presentation, I, I've tried to keep this um, as simple as possible, given the backdrop and, and everything that's going on. I thought um, the simpler, the better. It's about sort of 10 slides. I hope to only keep you about 20 minutes and then we can really start to sort of answer some of your questions around the UK markets um, and how I build portfolios. In terms of the agenda i really like to start with what is the fund i think you really want to get into is what is it that i do what is different about my fund what is different to me versus peers so why would you and me in terms of that uk income environment versus the other people in the investment trust income sector i have very strong views and that sort of drives my sector positioning so i've got a few slides that um hopefully will draw out why you outperform or underperform and what that might look like over the sort of years ahead, maybe some stock examples in terms of what we've been buying, where we're positioned, where I think structural growth is in the UK market over the next sort of two to three years. And clearly dividend, which is very important given this is a UK high income vehicle, the current sort of outlook uh, um, for the dividend for this year is about a 6% dividend yield. And I know an environment where bonds and cash is giving you not very much return. Um, that's a pretty uh, pretty attractive yield for our investors and hence why they're kind of attracted to this vehicle. So moving on, um, I really like this slide because I think it gives you a very quick overview of what I do. And as I said, what's different about the strategy that I've built. So this is a high conviction strategy that I took over in 2016, um, sorry, 2017 and there's been a lot of change in the portfolio. I've really concentrated the name count down to around about 35. A lot of people ask why so concentrated when a lot of my peers are around about sort of 50 to 60. Um, the answer is that there is a lot of work and diligence that goes into every stock that we put in this portfolio. It can take months and months of work, meetings, um, looking through financials. And to me, if you're gonna do all that work, on average in a 35 stock portfolio, you have a weight of about 3% in each position. 
I really don't see the point when you're running 50 or 60 stock portfolios, you have one and a half, two percent positions. I just don't feel that's worth the work that we do with the stocks we put into the fund. So that gives you an idea of why that that might be so concentrated. And because of the nature of the average three, my bigger positions or my conviction weights, if you want to call it that, the top 10 tends to end up being about 53% in absolute terms. Um, and again, we'll come to that later on in the slide. And I think those are the names that will really drive the alpha. I'm a quality growth investor at heart, really, but I think there's a lot been said about valuations recently and valuations have been exceptionally stretched in parts of the market. So in general, I like to be a little bit contrarian. I will not pay up for names. And I think in the current environment, that's proven to be right because a lot of those quality names are being hit exceptionally hard in the rotation. Um, and valuations are coming off because they weren't right in the first place. I'll maybe talk a little bit about the sort of positioning in terms of mega caps. I've been selling down mega caps over the last few years. Um, the portfolio is sort of balanced, maybe 40% FTSE 100, 40% 250, and then we've got some Europe and off market, which I think is a much better structure today, given the cover of, um, or the growth you get from sort of the mid cap sector versus the growth you get in um, the FTSE 100. And I'm completely benchmark agnostic. I know you have to peer group or look at my performance versus the benchmark or the index, but I really look nothing like the index. And I think that's why you would want to own me because you don't own, if you look at the key characteristics, you don't own telecom. So I have no BT, no Vodafone. I have no high street banks. I have no BPs, no shells no high street retail because I believe digital is the way forward. I have one real estate name. So I hope I do something a little bit different in the way I construct my sectors. Um, as Christine said at the start, I, I run um, or have been running European money. So I use Europe as a tool to differentiate the strategy. Again, I can, I can give you an example later on, but I really feel there are great quality assets across Europe. And if I can't find something similar in the UK, I use that as an alternative. And I'm a big believer in structural growth technology names. Um, some of these have worked reasonably well and of late they've been hit pretty hard. Again, I'm happy to uh, pick up on any of those names because I think this is a probably once in a decade opportunity to own some really good quality structural growth names at the right valuation. Maybe in terms of just managing the market, I mean, I sort of call it the worry wall, and I think there's an awful lot of things to worry about at the moment. Um, interest rates uh, are clearly very high on the agenda at the moment, and central bank policy, whether that be the US Fed or the Bank of England, perhaps yesterday has maybe changed some of people's views on how many rate tightening we will get, especially in the UK and Europe. I think the rhetoric's already been um supportive of fewer rate rises if we feel like inflation is going to be persistent or more persistent um central banks clearly have a very tough position at the moment of wanting to raise interest rates to curb inflation but on the other hand being very mindful of how the consumer's pockets being squeezed and not wanting to slow growth too much so because of that rotation that we've seen and because of the higher interest rates, clearly some of my positioning has been a significant headwind. I'll come back to why I think that mean reversion has broadly, broadly happened. Um, and in that, I mean the recovery in some of these very cyclical sectors has at least played out in a major part. And I don't think that will continue to be the headwind as we look forward. Um, I don't think this is a time to chase cyclical value. A lot of people are looking around the market saying, where can I find value? Where can I find value given the rhetoric around higher interest rates? Because this seems to be where people are positioning. My view is that's the wrong strategy. It might play out for the next 6, 12, 18 months. Personally, I'm looking for the really good quality um, growth names where valuations are coming back to levels that I think are much more attractive today. And they just haven't been in the range for me to buy over the last few years. And as I mentioned a minute ago, I really do believe the best quality technology names are being sort of baby and bathwater thrown out at the moment that all tech is not bad. There are very good quality businesses and very weak businesses. And I think if you find the winners, um, businesses that have solid moats over the long term, I think there's a really big opportunity to pick up uh, companies on valuations that we haven't seen for a long time. 
I talked about sector position, and I think this probably needs a little bit of explaining. So if you look at the left chart that we have on this page, essentially this is the FTSE all share. And what this is saying is, where am I positioned relative to the benchmark? So the top in blue, you have consumer discretionary, I'm 18.5% overweight. Now, consumer discretionary picks up a sort of catch-all of sector. So you have companies like Wizz Air in aviation in there. You have food delivery groups like Just Eat. You have luxury good companies like Richemont that own Cartier. So it is a little bit of a broad catch-all consumer sector. Um, but I'm significantly overweight there because I feel there's really attractive names in that space. Financials might need a little bit of explaining because I'm overweight, but I have no high street retail banks, your Barclays, HSBCs, Lloyds. What I am overweight is mid cap businesses that I think are really good quality, Close Brothers, Intermediate Capital, Brew and Dolphins. So those sort of names where I have high recurring revenue streams moats quality business models and i think you can see down the bottom in the sort of light gray where am i underweight energy i have no oil and gas utilities again i said i have nothing telecoms i have nothing and then when you look on the right hand side what you're seeing is what's a driving performance so you probably won't be surprised here to date that um, the three top performing sectors are oil and gas telecoms and banks um my view on these is generally i have no informational advantage on the oil price. I do not believe BP and Shell are good businesses. Um, their return on capital is not very good. Their CapEx discipline has been poor over the years. They've cut dividends through COVID, telecoms likewise. These are pipes to me. They have no competitive advantage when they're selling their products. Likewise, banks, I mean, they are so competitive. Everyone does the same. They sell a commodity. Why have they performed well? because of interest rates and people thought they were a little bit too cheap. But that to me does not make these good businesses. So I will stick to the view that I want to own quality businesses and the winners over the long run. And if I have to take a little bit of short term pain and performance, that's what I'm willing to do. I think this slide gives you a pretty good idea. I talked about the sort of 53% at the start that was in the top 10. That's absolute. These are, are relative positions to the benchmark. So I guess the bigger weights in the benchmark pull this down to around 38% in the top 10. But I think I spoke about structural, not cyclical growth in the businesses that I want to own. And as I said earlier on, what I'm looking for is through this volatile period, which of the businesses coming out the, the other side of this stronger and better and better positioned? And I looked at something like Bruin Dolphin, you know, a wealth manager. We're seeing a big structural growth in savings that's been going on for years. I think during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of younger investors come into the market, which bodes well for the future. People get used to investing in equities at a younger age. I think that's a very good thing for the market as a whole. Companies like Richemont, we've got structural growth in luxury. It's still aspirational. Oddly, through this this current environment, we've never seen such strong order books in luxury goods names globally, whether it be Ferrari, whether it be Rolex, whether it be Cartier. There are order books sitting there for 12, 18, 24 months to get hold of some of these products. Um, the rich keep getting richer in, in some environments and aspiration is still there. So there are other qualities I look for, something like um, Kerry Group, high levels of recurring revenue. So Kerry Group are involved in clean labeling, essentially. So when you look at the back of your food packets in, in supermarkets, sugar, salt, all the nasty um, things that you don't want to see in there, they help all the food manufacturers reduce that, take that out, keep the flavor, and really improve the quality of the products that you're buying. These are things that are structural megatrends that are going on in the industry. Um, and I've also got a little bit of sort of open up exposure, things like Compass Groups, so they do catering um, for football stadiums, sport events, festivals, companies, businesses. So as people are filtering back into going out and coming back to the office, Compass, which I'll touch on later, is gonna be one of the structural winners. A little bit about what I've been buying, it, it has been pretty difficult recently because a lot of these companies are not necessarily trading on fundamentals, they're trading on the backdrop. So as I sort of said earlier, it's me looking for sometimes a contrarian angle. Um, 
where the market is harshly treating a set of results or where they're just not looking at them because either they don't believe their value or they think they've got some short-term earnings headwinds that were basically as relation to COVID. So they got a boost from COVID and, and those are not going to be sustainable. So I've been adding to sort of businesses that, again, I think are coming out the other side of this stronger Beasley basically underwrites insurance risk. They got hit pretty hard by COVID claims. They got hit by some cyber underwriting claims. But these are businesses that have a huge amount of pricing power. So essentially, when they make losses, the year after that, you have to pay 20, 30, 40, 50 percent more sometimes to get your insurance premium. And this is something you have to buy. So this is a business that is completely agnostic to the cycle. It doesn't really matter what's happening in interest rates and inflation. Um, this is all about what's happening in their markets and how do they price that. And there aren't many companies globally that do this. It's a pretty tight market. It's pretty orderly. And these guys can pass through the pricing that they see. Deutsche Borsa, I talked about, this is not a time to chase um, value. This is a time to look for super high quality businesses that the market is selling off. Um, exchanges, this is an exchange, a little like London Stock Exchange. There are about three of these in Europe. It's a sort of monopolistic, duopolistic marketplace. They have very, very high levels of recurring revenue stream, about five to 10% top line growth every single year. It was trading on near 30 times multiple. And I picked this up around about 20 times. I think it's also a good example of a European stock. I didn't really like LSE at that particular time. They'd just done the deal with Refinitiv. I was a little bit nervous about the size of that acquisition, the integration risk, um, and owning Deutsche Börse in our European funds. I thought that was a really good um, opportunity to to add that to the portfolio. Just Eat, um, I think there's been a lot of noise around about this one, but ultimately, uh, I think if you break this business up, it's probably worth twice what it is today. Now, the market doesn't like it. I do. And often that's the opportunity over the long term. They have four of the best quality performing profitable assets. Um, and I think this is a business that's been hit by rotation. It's been hit by noise um, when I think strategically the management team are doing the right thing. Just a couple of, sort of stock examples that I think are, are interesting because I guess looking through COVID, the last thing you'd probably think would be good to own would be an airline. But actually, this is one where the share price is broadly, broadly above what it was pre-COVID. Um, why? Because they've been investing in the business. They're a low-cost carrier out of Eastern Europe. They're about 150 planes in sort of size today. They've got a very young, very economical fleet. They've been essentially moving and growing into UK and Italian markets as your flag carriers, your Lufthansa's, your BAs, your Air France KLM's have pulled back because fundamentally they don't have the balance sheet to support, support themselves and support the growth. Um, they've done such a good job through the last two years because they've had an opportunity to really look at the root network where they have bases. Um, the cost structure of the business, and they've really nailed that down to, to, to um, get a competitive advantage on the other side. It's a little early to tell you what summer 2022 will like, but it looks like pent-up demand is very, very high for people to go away this summer in a market where capacity is down nearly 20 to 30%, as other airlines have had to um, ground planes. They look really well-placed with their 50% capacity growth into this year to really drive some big profit numbers out um, out of this year. The other one is Compass. Again, I said I want to own businesses that are better on the other side. I've talked about this being a catering business. Um, actually, margins are nearly back to where they were at pre-COVID levels, despite things like business and uh, industry only being at 77% of pre-pandemic levels as the US and other parts of the world haven't quite filtered back to the office yet. There's a structural outsourcing trend that's continuing. If you run your own kitchen, you were essentially sitting on a fixed cost through COVID, no people coming through. Um, if you take on Compass's business, you essentially turn a fixed cost into a variable cost. So I think a lot of people are looking at what is a new world 
um, in, in a post-COVID world look like in terms of people coming through, how I manage that, how I manage infrastructure, how I become more digital, how I manage the flow of people through um, through these facilities. And Compass have been a huge structural winner um, in terms of new contracts over the last uh, three, six, 12 months that are going to ramp up as they come out the other side. So these are the sort of businesses that I think really will be the winners and why these are in the top 10 of the fund today. A little bit on dividends, clearly, because this is a dividend fund. We performed exceptionally well in 2020 um, because we didn't own shells that cut for the first time since World War II. We didn't own any of the high street banks because they were forced by the regulator to cut dividends. So actually, we managed to support um, a much better revenue and actually increased our dividend through um, 2020 and 2021, despite this environment. Um, we have had a record year in terms of special dividends. So whilst underlying, the expectation is that dividend growth will be 5% in 2022. When you strip out some of those special dividends, actually, they think dividend growth is going to be down about 7% this year. This is Link Asset Monitor that put together this data. So it's going to be another pretty tough year in terms of dividend growth unless you own the right quality names in the right places with the right balance sheets. Um, the trust has actually nearly covered the dividend for this year in terms of our revenue, which again is a very good position to be sitting in given we have a lot of gearing still to put back into the market. There are a lot of um, higher yielders given the market's pulled back recently that we can add to. Um, and the trust also has some names that are paying out pretty significant returns. Just yesterday, we had one of our Spanish house builders that doubled its return from 50 million to 100 million. So a near 11% dividend yield for this year, which is very significant in this environment and for the trusts. So I think in, when you look at dividends in the whole, this is all about owning the right companies at the moment in the right places if you want to get some dividend growth out. This is just a highlight of. Um, of how we've performed. So despite the volatility, despite everything that's gone on, despite the near 40% decline in dividends in 2020, when almost everything stopped, the board and uh, and myself as the manager, we've been, we've been pretty resolute that we are going to use some reserves to pay you the dividend. This is your money as an investor in this vehicle. And actually there's been a very consistent track record of increasing the dividend. And we've talked again this year about at least a 5.4 pence per share at the sort of 82 pence share price you're getting an above 6% yield. It's not going to, to keep up with inflation in the current environment, but we think sort of steady low single digit growth every year is what we're aiming to deliver from for our investors, despite the fact that a 6% yield we're already probably at or near the very top of the, um, the yield curve for UK income funds. I have to talk about... Um, Performance clearly, I think what I've said in at the start of this presentation around my pos sector positioning, my views has meant this last year has been particularly tough. Over the three years, it's still behind, um, given what we've been facing and over the five. But I feel the vehicle's exceptionally well placed to perform as I look ahead over the next few years. And I think that mean reversion of Shell's already gone up 144% since the sort of lows in September of 2020. Banks have recovered massively. Those headwinds are coming out. And I really feel that a lot of the names in the top 10 have got a significant amount of growth ahead, whether that's post-COVID or just structural growth for companies like Wiz or Compass as we come out of the pandemic. So despite the short-term underperformance, um, which has been particularly tough, I feel that we're in a good place to deliver over the coming years. I have to run through these for compliance reasons, but essentially these just break down the, the annual performance figures, which um, I've just talked about. And at the back, you can see the last year annual figures to the end of March. The calendar year end for this vehicle is the end of March. So um, those are the, there for you to peruse. I think the, uh, the um, presentation is going to remain on the website. So I will maybe stop speaking there and hand back to Alessandro or Christine, and we can maybe take some of your questions.
Philip, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the top right hand corner of your screen. However, just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed by your investor dashboard. Christine, if I may hand over to you to run the Q&A session, that would be great. Could I ask you to read out those questions where appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Super, thanks very much. Yes, we've had a good few questions come in, so we'll fly through them and keep uh, submitting them as we go. So one from Jamie is, at the end of January, you held 8% in non-index names. Which names are these and what's the investment case for them? Um, non-index names are generally AIM. So things like uh, ASOS, THG, they, they tend to be some of the um, techie style names. Um, I still have a, an awful lot of faith, I think. Um, I was just talking about the sort of once in a decade opportunity uh, in these tech names. I don't really mind whether they're main market listed or not. Actually, ASOS is about to jump on the main list, as is THG. You get a little bit more clarity in terms of reporting when they're on the main list. But in general, the reason I own these is the thesis of the businesses. Um, ASOS has been through good times and tough times, clearly. At the moment, they're going through a pretty tough time. But you can buy a business on sub sort of six times EV EBITDA or a 13 times PE multiple next year for something that in a very tough 2022 is going to deliver about 10 to 15 percent top line growth. I think these businesses are being valued incorrectly at the moment. I haven't added to them yet because I don't think the market is quite there but um i think at, at some point in time these will be much bigger positions in the portfolio because they're really good quality names with um, great moats perfect thanks um another question is about your market cap split and what do you think is the best type of proportion in different market caps um and specifically do you have any small cap exposure but you've referred there to aim stocks so maybe a little bit on that. yeah i mean the the major shift that I made, I think we were about 75 to 80 percent FTSE 100 when I took this on. So I think I don't I don't really want to say that FTSE 100 companies are necessarily bad versus FTSE 250 are necessarily good. The point was more Shell, BP, Vodafone, HSBC. I did not see a moat or a competitive advantage in these names. FTSE 250 companies tend to be growing quicker. They tend to be have less research or less analyst notes on them. So you have more opportunity to create an informational advantage in those companies that you can see by doing all the diligence and work. So the balance is more driven by what are the qualities of the business model I see. And as I just sort of said, um, if it's bottom end of FTSE 100 or FTSE 250 or AIM or Europe, it really doesn't matter. What does it bring to the portfolio? Um, and I think around about 40, 40 and 10 and, and 10 on sort of non-market, we've got a pretty good balance. But if it moved up or moved down in any of these um, weightings, it would be driven by the underlying securities rather than me trying to drive a specific exposure to those different levels of indices. Perfect. Thanks. That makes sense. Um, what is on your radar or watch list? Um, James <laughs> asking, any examples of growth value that you know you're mentioning on slide six? Um, so basically, I'm looking at a lot of the quality names that I have. Not, I mean, there's some great quality sort of industrial names: Spirax, Sarcos, um, Halmas, Rotorx, um, in software companies like Aveva. These are businesses that have been trading in sort of 30, 40 times plus multiples. Now they might have fallen anywhere between sort of 15 and 40 percent but a lot of these are still trading in the 28 to 32 times p multiple ranges my view is if that's closer to the 2025 times now that really depends on the growth of the business i don't think you sit and go a p multiple is an output it's an output of the growth that companies are delivering um so it's not low p is cheap high p is expensive it's kind of what you're getting for that but as I said, I want to own quality businesses. This is not a time for me to go, do I want to own some banks? Do I want to own some cyclicals? Do I want to own some cheap industrials? This is about super high quality businesses, really wide moats that are getting back to the point where they're just about at valuations I can, I can take maybe another 5p 
key points of um, of downside um, in the rotation, and and those would be um, the subspench names, as I like to call them, would be uh, vying for a position in the portfolio. Great, thanks for that. So this is a bit of a long question, so bear with me, and I'm going to flip it on its head from Callum. So in an income strategy where you're holding active weights, which are significant, and he's referring to um, an example, which I'll come back to, but how far out are you willing to defer return of capital to shareholders via dividends? Um, and then just another comment related to it is Delivery Hero, again, pushed out expectations of achieving profitability in its most recent guidance at the cost of revenue growth seems to have been above that of the revenue acquired so that's kind of a bit of context as well to the question about are you going to deliver more in terms of capital through dividends um so i think there are sort of two slightly different questions i'll take delivery hero later but i think one thing i've tried to do with this portfolio is what it had become is very FTSE 100 and top end heavy and the problem that you have when you get up there is dividend yields at seven eight and nines don't grow so what i've tried to do is balance the portfolio more to the sort of mid cap names where you can find four fives and six in the dividend world that are growing 10 to 15 percent so that's where you generate some dividend growth and because of the balance that I've created and the structure of the portfolio, I've also been able to put in some zero yielders. So I think some of this question is about how do I own stocks that are yielding zero and the capital returns are getting pushed out? If I've heard it correctly, if not, they can mm -hmm. come back in and answer that. But I think you need the balance of all of the above. I will ho hold an ASOS because I think the structural growth over five or 10 years, you will get a capital return and we can turn that into a dividend for you in some shape or form. I don't really mind where my total return comes from. I have a dividend to pay. I know how much income I need to generate. And if I can generate that income out of the portfolio structure that I have, I will own zero yielders if I believe they are the right zero yielders to own over the next five year cycle. Um, so that's about total return. So you can get 5% of earnings growth and a 5% dividend yield, you get 10%. Or you can get 10% purely from earnings with an ASOS or a delivery hero I don't really mind how that's generated as long as I can provide the income for you. Um, I think the other point is sort of valid around the same thing. You're pushing out a capital return from for Delivery Hero. I'm not owning Delivery Hero today because I think it's going to pay a dividend in the next three or five years. I'm not. I own Delivery Hero because I think it is market leader in what, 91, 92% of its markets today. And I think in about 85% of that, it's more than 2x its nearest peer. So it has a huge structural and competitive advantage. Now, the point is very valid at the moment that they bought Glovo and they've taken another 380 million euro hit to EBITDA this year. So again, they've deferred the profitability even further out. And in the current environment, the market is not happy with that. It doesn't like companies that are not necessarily making money. But I think there's a different question here. Delivery Hero can make money tomorrow. They just need to shut off certain things and start charging for others. They could easily turn a profit. That's not the point. The point is, do they cement their position now while they can to come out the other side of the stronger? And my view is I will back this management team who have executed almost flawlessly. If you stop looking at a share price for what the fundamentals of the company's doing, then I think they're doing the right things and the right strategy for the market wants to sell it off 20 or 25% because it doesn't like these losses being pushed out for another two years, then those are decisions I have to make because I think this business can be five times bigger in the next 10 years. And those are the calls that you make on quality business models. And in the short term, you sometimes have to take some pain. I think that, the statement was always made Amazon fell 90% five times in the first 10 years of its iteration. So it's not easy sometimes scaling these businesses and building them, but everyone will look back and go, well, it would have been the right decision to own it. And that's sometimes the view you have to take. If that answers his question, if not, he can come back to us. <laughs> Yeah, we appreciate that. Um, so I think you tackled it well. And there's a few questions coming in on um, THG. So uh, I'll just combine David and Jamie. Um, I welcome your views on THG. Do you regret buying it at the entry price? And then another one, are you still holding it? And if so, why? And what's the bull case from here? Um, 
So, I do regret buying it. Like, I think um, as fund managers, you face challenges in most companies you own. It, it doesn't matter what I have in my portfolio. At some point, every single company is going to have a challenge. Um, I don't actually with GHG have any regrets on buying this because I don't look at headlines in newspapers. I look at fundamentals. Um, I've had about 15 meetings with THG. I've been up to Manchester and sat with CEO Matt Moulding. I sat with the head of nutrition. I sat with the head of Ingenuity, their software distribution platform. Um, I've sat with the head of BT. I've been around all the facilities. I've looked at their studios. I've looked at their manufacturing. I've looked at their new pick and pack facility that they've been spending tens and tens of millions on. And when I look at this business, I see since IPO, a lot of upgrades have come through. We've seen a huge structural shift of people online. Beauty and nutrition are very resilient categories and people at Nestle are paying very big premiums for those sort of health and wellness business models and have done recently. There has been a lot of noise around some of the corporate governance things. Now, I knew those corporate governance issues when I bought into this. He has cleaned it up. He's about to go on main list. He's about to announce a chairman and split the CEO and chairman role. He's paid back some some loans that he got that were related to THG stocks. I think they're really doing all they can to clean this up. But sometimes when people attack you um, and papers attack you, people read headlines. And that's something that we have to deal with all the time. I think the three individual businesses, I think beauty is exceptionally, exceptionally unique business and global. And I think Ingenuity is world class. It's just really, really early in its iteration. But Nestle do not have 140 million pound 10 year contracts with companies when they don't do something very, very good. Because Nestle could do this on their own. They have billions to invest, but they've gone with THG because they have a global one-stop shop, one -stop shop solution for them. So for me, yes, I can look at share price and go, that doesn't look like a very good decision. Or I can go, has the fundamentals of the individual entities changed? To me, they've changed for the better, but the market is saying something different. If that helps. Yeah, definitely. Um, switching gear a little bit, Michael's asking, does liquidity in the number of shares traded have an impact on your decision to invest? There are a number of listed companies that have a good income profile but are tightly held. So I wonder if he's referring to the trust or actually the, the companies that you're investing in. Maybe answer on both sides. Um, <laughs> I, I, think that's, I think that's a fair question. Probably more of an issue in small caps generally when you're investing in them but because the size of this vehicle 120 130 million and because it's closed end i don't have a liquidity issue per se it's pretty easy for me to i mean i think the smallest company I own is probably kieran holmes 800 ish odd million i think we own about seven percent of the company um those are not numbers that are too extreme if i wanted to make trades i could um but liquidity is always something you have to have a look at. And I think there are times in the market where liquidity is good and times that are bad. I mean, ultimately, when share prices are performing badly, liquidity dries up. I mean, I think that's pretty natural. Um, in terms of the trust, it is small and it can be illiquid at times. It should be fine for retail investors at general retail levels of, of what people are buying. Some of our bigger institutional shareholders have been able to trade significant portions of the stock recently. So yes, there can be a bit of um, illiquidity in it. It's something we're looking at and it's something that we are trying to improve because we want to grow this vehicle. And the more we grow it over the years ahead, the more the, that we can improve liquidity for you. Exactly. Now, final question is on ESG. How important is that when you're deciding to invest? Um, I need to be very careful here, don't I? Because we're a big uh, ESG house. But I think the simple answer is ESG is absolutely embedded into everything we do. So it's embedded into the way we value companies, how we think about it. So broadly, broadly, if you have operational risk, as in how do you run your business, you have financial risk in terms of your balance sheet, your debt, liquidity, do I have enough of it? And you have ESG or risk in terms of governance, which I think I've just mentioned in terms of THG, you have to take on some of those government risks. But if you are a business uh, today, 
you are going to get taxed or they are going to place issues, uh, they are going to place cash flow constraints on your business if you do not toe a line in some way or have a very clear view of your carbon neutrality or what you're doing and how you're investing in that. Now there are the complete converts that say we are not going far enough. I think ESG has come under um, a huge amount of attention, as a huge amount of focus, and companies are trying to put things out there. Um, what we don't want is greenwashing. We want this to happen properly. We want companies to deal with it properly. We want them to set targets which we think are achievable. So when I look at companies I own, it's very important in the process of do I think they're more or less likely to come out the other side of this better, as I've said before, in terms of they're well positioned. So digital businesses are incredibly well positioned because they don't really have any assets. So they don't have those sort of things. Luxury good companies make so much money, they'll just charge you more for it. So I think the element of pricing power here is important in ESG as well. But um, I think you need to be really mindful about ESG, ESG, and the fact that a lot of people are chasing this style. We've seen a lot of funds open, a lot of things being launched, and there aren't enough really good quality ESG names out there, which I think is why you saw valuations go exceptionally high and why we've seen a collapse in a lot of these this year it will take time for us to build wind farms to build solar farms to really get companies that are helping the environment supporting the environment and they will come but i think you need to be very careful what you pay for those assets and how early they are in the evolution because this is um not going to be a one or two year thing this is going to be a 5 10 20 year thing Philip, Christine, thank you for that. And I think you've addressed all those questions you can from investors. And of course, if any further questions come in, we'll, uh, we'll publish those responses on the InvestorMe company platform. Um, just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company. Philip, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Um, yeah, well, thank you all. I know you're all very important and, and, uh, and busy and uh, your time is appreciated today. I hope that was a sort of useful insight to BMO UK High Income if you haven't heard it before. Um, we're trying to do something different. Um, I think we are. I think we're doing something pretty unique in terms of our concentrated strategy. We're delivering an exceptionally attractive yield and I think the next three to five years we're really well positioned to, to drive some uh, performance out of the portfolio. Um, but if there's anything else you further need, reach out to Christine. There's fact sheets, there's uh, videos on our website. Clearly, um, the the presentation and, and questions will be on the website here today as well at Investor Meet. So please do forward us any questions or any thoughts and views. They'd be much appreciated. Philip, Christine, thank thanks to you both for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete. However, I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of BMO UK High Income Trust PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.